I've had a wonderful beginning to my evening today, uh, and I'm very honored to be in such erudite company. I'm not, uh, I'm an academic in a number of fields, but not a theologian. And today I represent only myself and my personal views, not a representative of any institution. And I think that's very important because preparing this talk, I was very uh, honored to be invited uh, by RJ and Eastern University uh, because I was struck by this question of the perils and promise of Islam in the public space. And this is a nerve-wracking question to contemplate for a Muslim. Um, and it is a delicate topic for anyone who is not a Muslim to approach. And some of the things that you're going to hear this evening will um, probably uh, provoke a number of questions. And certainly in the public arena have triggered a dialogue where accusations of Islamophobia are rife. So I don't come here in that spirit. And I thank you for the safety and transparency of this conversation that we're going to have. Um, the, the, uh, the initial uh, image that you saw in this window that you see now are from the Lahore Killer. Lahore was once known as the Paris of Hindustan. It is a city uh, which is very beloved to most uh, Pakistanis and very envied by the Indians who no longer can count Lahore in their territory after the British partition. It was built by Shah Jahan, a 16th century Mughal ruler who ultimately would build uh, the Taj Mahal at, as a memory to his wife Mumtaz. And this is a typical window uh, which would divide the public from the private. There's a lot of division of um, spaces and ideas uh, in Islam as there are in all belief systems, a division between what can be known and what remains sacred, what is pure, what is impure, or as we say in Islam, what is halal and what is haram. And th the reason the conversation is important is nowhere in my non-theological, non-academic reading could identify a definition of the public space. My interpretation of the public space is a shared space where people from all dimensions are going to uh, interact and commingle. The public space is in part owned by the government, but it is also owned by the citizens of that government. And the citizens or subjects of the British realm, as I am one, wherever you are, are as empowered or as disempowered as the leaderships that they face. So what we're going to see as we go forward is what happens to a public space where individuals are very disempowered, unlike any of us here uh, this evening. And this uh, talk is going to really be uh, a series of narratives. The public space is actually what I regard as the battleground for all issues pertaining to Islam, because there is a tremendous struggle going on globally and regionally and locally in Muslim majority countries and in non-Muslim majority countries, as uh, the country of my origin, Britain is, or the adoptive home that I've made here in the United States. And that narrative is struggling for primacy in the public space. And I will present you what I think my perspective of a narrative is, which may not be shared by uh, the, the, the loudest voices or the most politically empowered voices. That battle that you must understand, and many of you will be very familiar with, is a battle between what we know to be Islam and what is currently passing for Islam, but is in reality something called political Islamism, with which you may be very familiar. This struggle is what we are going to see in our journeys uh, somewhat in Saudi Arabia, we will begin the talk, then into post 9-11 Europe, where we will go, and into current contemporary the United States, where we're going to venture. And then finally, we're going to focus actually much more on Pakistan in this talk, where I think you will see my experiences of Islam in the public space and how they are currently manifesting. But this is always going to be a struggle between Islam, Islam and Islamism. Um, before I go further, let me define what I mean by Islam. By Islam, I mean the uh, religion that was carried to humanity by the messenger, uh, the prophet Muhammad. It is a religion of monotheism. It is a religion that recognizes all religions that came before it. Uh, the book 
of Islam is the Quran, which Muslims believe is the divine and revealed word and has not been altered since its revelation. It was initially re revealed in oral form to uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, who was illiterate, and that's thought to be a deliberate choice that so he could not manufacture any words. And it is a religion which, which values recognizing one maker, recognizing all of the prophets that came before the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Muhammad as the messenger of Islam. It places a high degree of value on worship, on charity, on service to others. And if you're very fortunate and you're healthy, perhaps you will observe Ramadan and you will observe visiting Mecca. This is what we mean by Islam. Political Islamism is a contemporary ideology. It is from the 20th century. We can think of its roots are in the 1920s. Uh, it is a totalitarian political ideology which has a number of aberrant principles which are anathema to believing Muslims. It believes in reinstating an Islamic state called a Nizam Islami. It conveys a necessity for a Sharia or so-called Islamic laws, which actually are often a reinvention and a very modern day reinvention. It involves institutionalized Islamism in political bodies, and it'll become clear as we go forward. It is very heavily invested in anti-Semitism, and it has religionized anti-Semitism to a highly dangerous degree. And it borrows the language and texts and powerful um, uh, characteristics of a 1,500-year-old religion. And it melds it into a very frightening and very unforgiving uh, supremacist fascist politic. That's what I mean by political Islamism. Anybody who wants to read more about that, I can refer you to Bassam Tibi, a German scholar who's written uh, over... Uh, 28 books and is one of the master uh, interpreters of political Islamism and uh, you, will, you will find the work disturbing and very provocative. But that's Islamism and Islam. There's a very big difference. Unfortunately, many individuals are not aware of this difference. We'll begin with my time in Saudi Arabia. Some of you may have read of my adventures there. Uh, in the picture you see Saudi Arabia is ruled current currently by King Abdullah, who was crown prince when I lived there. And even as crown prince, he was uh, functioning really as a head of state, as the current king was quite ill and quite debilitated, and is, I think, fairly regarded as a reformer of the kingdom. Even a monarch has great difficulty instituting reforms in this Islamic theocracy. Many of the values of this Islamic theocracy are anathema to Islam. And that the values that it's most well known for are the absolute gender segregation that is present in every public space and almost all private spaces. One of the few desegregated areas in Saudi Arabia is the practice of postgraduate medicine. That is not desegregated. So a common question I get asked, did I treat male patients? Yes, I even trained male Saudi doctors, many of whom were military officers, much to their chagrin. I was the first woman that they reported to in many cases. Not an easy situation for them or me. But this is a country really of men. This, that, that, that obviously was, uh, I did not meet the king, that was not my photograph. This is my photograph. When I visit the kingdom now, I am treated very politely, very much as a, 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 a guest, as the way you're treating me. And so many of my privileges are that of an honorary male. There is only one woman that visits the kingdom who is not required to veil um, that we know of, and that is the Queen of England. And the way that they get around the Queen meeting and moving in Saudi Arabia without a veil is she's designated an honorary male. And so, uh, you, will, you will hear more about my family, but many times I feel my parents, the Islam that I have comes from my parents, they have given it to me equally with all of the freedoms that my two younger brothers have. In some ways, I've seized more freedom even than my brothers had. And in a society that divides you according to gender, 
there are privileges accorded to men that are not accorded to women. This is profoundly un-Islamic, and I refer to it and have done in the public record as gender apartheid. There is no protests in universities about the apartheid in Saudi Arabia. There are about other countries, but this is truly a separation. Um, I would become, when I arrived there as a professional physician, uh, effectively an invisible woman. This was not my choice of title, this was my publisher, something I vehemently protested and later have come to acquiesce. Everything about the woman in the public space is regulated and attenuated. Women should be preferably not seen and even more preferably not heard. Um, and this is just an image of a veiled woman and you see her with a bowed head rather like uh, on the co cover of my book. And perhaps I wasn't going to be quite like that, but I was going to be joining the ranks of women like this. And what you will see is, uh, if anyone is not familiar, there is uh, enforcement of veiling in Saudi Arabia in the public space. The enforcement is through peer pressure, social expectation, and also ranks of the religious police that we call the Mutawa'in, who incidentally belong to the Committee for the Promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice, which is a not so inviting uh, uh, way of uh, trying to enjoin the public good. Enjoining the public good is a profound Islamic value, but they have managed to turn it upside down so that it becomes very intimidating. You will hear different laws. There is no written law in Saudi Arabia. The constitution is deemed to be the Quran, and Sharia is an oral body of law in Saudi Arabia. So nobody will say there is a certain legal code saying women cannot drive or women cannot be unveiled. But there are all kinds of structures and pressures that ensure that you are veiled. So for a woman like me, in my workplace, I was required always to wear clothing covering up to my wrists and ankles and a doctor's coat. There was actually a policy in my hospital, which was a flagship military hospital, all Muslim women should be uh, veiled. I never adopted it. Nobody in my family had adopted their idea of a veil, and we'll talk about that, including my grandmother's. So I wasn't going to do it for an employee policy, and I was never apprehended in my workplace. Since I've left there, troops of religious police have entered the hospital and have begun harassing women on occasion. Um, outside the hospital, I had left my car in New York. I had to have a driver, wait for a driver, take me wherever I needed, and uh, I was subject to any kind of scrutiny that any woman alone might face in Riyadh in the late 90s, which is when I lived there. Late 90s is a critical time because it was pre-September 11th. Post-September 11th, Saudis admit there have been a relaxation of some of these uh, um, harassments because there's been a very uh, serious crackdown on some of the um, uh, f fanatical um, uh, rhetoric and values that had uh, really influenced the religious police. And that's been a direct effect of looking for jihadists and jihadism in the kingdom. But you see these women, these are typical Saudi women. I'm guessing that they are celebrating Saudi Arabia's National Day, which falls in September. One of them is wearing a badge of the King Abdullah on her abaya. Uh, one of them is wearing the national flag, which incidentally is the oath that anyone takes if they believe in Islam, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, which means I believe in one God, Muhammad is the messenger. If you say it with belief, you are considered a Muslim and it has become a national insignia, not without the Saudi sword, which is part of the problem with Islam in the public space. This juxtaposition of new values with an ancient uh, and very uh, 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 revered philosophy is one of the examples of how Islam is becoming politicized. Um, you see that they're decorated women. They're, they're wearing black. Uh, we call them abayas, which is the Arabic word for veil. It's from the one piece is covering the whole body to the floor. Um, there is one lady in the back. Her face is exposed. That is called a hijab. You see hijabs in America quite regularly now. And there are ladies in the front who are covering over the bridge of their nose, which is called the niqab. And some of them are highly made up and some of them are not. 
in terms of makeup is what I mean. And so this kind of variety, these were my very, these were my colleagues, not these women, but women like this. Many of my orthodox um, Saudi colleagues, and I use the word loosely in terms of orthodox, but those that are really uh, subscribing to a very rigid um, uh, the interpretation of veil would wear the veil over the medical clothing, would wear the veil, the head veil, the face veil, and if they were then operating on a patient, would wear all of the sterile gowns that we do. So a real hardship in my mind, but for them it was business as usual. Many of the women, and I was training some of the first female physicians in Saudi Arabia at the time, now many of them are running departments or professors themselves, would have specially designed uh, doctor's coats that would come down to the ankle. So they would look rather uh, monastic in their appearance, for want of a better word, uh, in all this modification. Wearing trousers for a woman was unheard of. I was one of the first women there that they'd seen in trousers because uh, this is considered not too feminine and somehow, uh, in their minds, un-Islamic. And uh, I can tell you a funny story about that. There were many clashes that I had in the kingdom because I was absolutely unread about Saudi Arabia. I had no cultural competence in Saudi Arabia. I had very little cultural sensitivity. I was uh, 31 years old and I had just come from New York with all these credentials. And as a Muslim, I felt what I've had adequate faith literacy. I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, we know that this is a beautiful photograph of the Hajj which is the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. And by chance, I stumbled into my own Hajj. There's a saying that goes that no Muslim goes to Mecca until he's invited by his maker. And so apparently my invitation came along in the form of another physician. Everybody was going to make the pilgrimage because they thought, who knows when they're next going to be there. And I was supposed to stay behind and manage all the patients. And one doctor said, well, you should go, you know, it's your right. And incidentally, at that time, we had a Canadian Christian chairman who was very uh, animated character, Dr. McIntyre. And my colleague said, and he cannot prevent you as a Christian to go to your rightful pilgrimage, which I never in my life had anyone in my family ever discuss this. Southeast Asians or people that are from Pakistan tend to often go later on in life when they've had their children, married all their children, and they're getting close to death and then they tend to go. So nobody in our family would go in their 30s. But for some reason, that struck me, and I decided to go to the Hajj. And I went, again, in violation of requirements. A Muslim woman is required to go with a male relative at a requirement. So I had no brothers handy, no father available, no other male relative, no son, uh, no husband. And so I showed up by myself. And there is a mechanism for such unfortunate entities as women who have no male, uh, it's called maharam, uh, no male relative. And that is to send them with other unfortunate women in a group and some man will take uh, care of them. And I'm being facetious here, but that's really how it felt. And I found that I was then assigned to a Saudi group of married women and this was to be my community. And to give you an idea of how alien I'm telling you how alien this culture was for me. I was utterly alien for them. So much so that during uh, the one, well, there are many great things about Hajj, but from my standpoint, uh, the prayers are very short for the pilgrim because uh, I find it hard to stand a long time in prayer. I'm an impatient person. So this was a great bonus to me that all of the prayers are very abbreviated <coughs> Uh, so that the, this makes it easier for the pilgrim who's there already in supplication for many days. So I was doing one of my short prayers inside the tent in which I was staying with these women. I, I didn't bring pictures of the tents. And uh, I took off my abaya because I'm in front of women. And I covered my scarf, uh, hair, hair scarf, and I began praying. And in the middle of my prayer, there are these calls for haram, haram. I'm thinking, my goodness, haram. I don't know what the Christian equivalent would be, but a, a Jewish equivalent is a uh, non-kosher, something trafe is happening. And, but I couldn't turn around and see what it was because we were supposed to be praying. And apparently I was the offending entity. I was the haram entity for praying without the veil, for praying and standing in front of God in trousers, for not putting the scarf over my earlobes instead of behind my pinna. And uh, this was extraordinary. 
Later, when the group became more sympathetic, they discovered I was a doctor and they asked me to help them with their various aches and pains. And I acted like a shaman. I gave them Tylenol from wherever and whatever I had with me. Uh, now they looked at me more kindly and asked me, how long since I converted to Islam? And are my parents converts too? And so you can tell that there was a terrible clash of identities. The Hajj is an extraordinary event. And the Hajj, of course, predates Islam by approximately 2,000 years. This, we believe, ka the Kaaba is the spot that was originally, um, uh, if the right word is consecrated, Abraham laid the foundation for this, we think, related to a blueprint provided by the angel Gabriel, or Jibrail, we call him. And uh, previously, it was always a center for worshipers, um, originally formed for monotheism, uh, later uh, had uh, succumbed to a uh, site of uh, pilgrimage for polytheists, and then the Prophet Muhammad restored it to become a pinnacle of worship for monotheists. So this um, has been the spiritual center of Islam. The initial spiritual center of Islam was actually Jerusalem until uh, the uh, Prophet then was able to make Mecca a place for monotheism. It is now in the modern era uh, uh, area only allowed for Muslims to enter. I have not been able to identify the scriptural basis for that. Nobody has been able to give me a reference for that, but I may be ignorant. And so when you approach Mecca, however you're coming, there are highways and causeways which ask the non-Muslims non to go to a certain direction, and there are highways where the Muslims go forward. So this is, a, this is an isolated area. This is the picture of the mosque in Mecca, which is called the Haram Sharif. It just means the Grand Mosque. And you're seeing people assembling, and come around if you can't see the pictures, you'll see people assembling in the order of approximately 750,000 people at each level. There are three levels in that mosque. Uh, the picture is taken very uh, close to the complex, but the four courts hold approximately 180,000 people, and they revolve anti-clockwise around the Kaaba. We don't worship the Kaaba. We feel it is a, uh, it's a location that is directly under the throne of God. And it is a place that never stops moving. Even during the siege of Mecca in 1979, which we think was instigated by, I think, Iranian Shia Muslims attempting to overturn uh, some of the political power and prestige held by the Saudis by controlling the Hajj, uh, people, uh, there were 400 people who were murdered in that incident and all the worshippers stopped, but the birds continued revolving around the Kaaba is what people often say. So this is a dynamic area. There are Muslims that come from 183 different countries as of last year's Hajj. When I went there, it was approximately 160 different nationalities. If you go there, every ethnicity and every race, you are likely to hear Hausa, you're likely to hear uh, Serbian, you're likely to hear someone from Newark, New Jersey. You can hear this, you hear. And it shows, uh, interestingly to me, this was the place where I felt, now I found my place in Islam because I don't have to look like a Pakistani lady in Karachi or how my mother looks. I don't have to look like a lady in Riyadh. I can look like this and be Muslim. It is extraordinarily diverse. And this is an area where segregation is not permitted. There is a move, gender segregation is not permitted. If you make Hajj, you are not allowed to cover your face. The niqab is not allowed in the Hajj. So at the very center of Islam, the cradle of Islam, we have gender desegregation <coughs> Uh, and unless the woman feels uncomfortable, the crowds can be quite tremendous. If you feel uncomfortable and you're dislocated from your family or your group, you can cover your face if you feel embarrassed for some reason. But the whole point is that you are standing and it is a meeting that you are having with your maker in this world. And your maker does not distinguish between male and female. Your maker does not distinguish between prince and pauper, king and peasant. It is all about egalitarianism. And it is supposed to be a metaphor that the only way this can happen, and about 10 years of my academic medical work was on Hajj medicine with Saudi colleagues, the only way that you can manage the massive crowds, where crowd density can exceed seven to nine individuals per square meter at times of crisis, where individuals are arriving to Jeddah 
uh, at the King Khalid Airport at the rate of 50,000 individuals an hour, where at the end of Hajj, over a million head of cattle are sacrificed by proxy and go immediately into refrigerated airplanes to be distributed to the hungry all over the world. The only way you can do that is with the cooperation of the individuals in each crowd, in each group that might have come from maybe this town. There have been perhaps people from St. David's that have gone there. There is no way that this cannot occur without cooperation. You also cannot execute any kind of violent act or hostility once you enter the territory of Hajj. And it was always historically a sanctuary. It was a sanctuary for the many travelers who would come from uh, Africa up to going towards Syria and they would take respite. There were pre-Islamic area, uh, pre-Islamic Arabia warring tribes and warring um, factions that would uh, operate through banditry and that was suspended in this area. So it is actually a sanctuary. Uh, but one of the ways, I mean, individuals do not come really uh, with a spirit of violence, but you have to be patient. You cannot raise your temper. You cannot show your frustration. And that's how two and a half million people get through this routine, which happens every year based on the lunar calendar. So the Saudis only have about nine months to plan each. Imagine we'd spend seven years planning each Olympics, maybe a year or two years planning each inauguration. So management of the Hajj, I feel, is one bright light of Islam in the public space, not Islamism. So much so that President Obama's original inauguration on when he first became president, two million people were anticipated on the mall. The same teams that manage Hajj in Saudi Arabia were asked to consult with White House National Security and CDC, help us manage these crowds. When we have uh, the Hajj happening with pandemic flu or we have it with SARS or we have it with other issues, then internationally, the World Health Organization uh, the CDC, other major groups collaborate across religions and across nationalities um, to engage with all 183 countries where individuals come from to prevent the spread of disease. So with all of the deficiencies Saudi Arabia has, which I think are profound and many are un-Islamic, this is one area where Islam functions in a public uh, space for Muslims in this area, but also in a public space that involves others. Um, I spent two years in Saudi Arabia. There are many other things I can tell you about, after which I returned to my native Europe or Britain. Britain had changed a lot. I left Saudi Arabia about six weeks after September 11th, purely by coincidence. It was the time for my contract to end, but it seemed a good point to leave the region. There was uncertainty as, a, as to what would happen. And the conflict, uh, the US conflict or the long war in Afghanistan had just been launched before, um, uh, had, was just being launched before I, I left, I think in October 2001, I think is the date. And I found um, that England had changed uh, somewhat. It will stay on this side. I, one of the things I did when I came back to England was I was asked to practice medicine in East London, in Whitechapel, if any of you know, and some of you I know have lived in London. Um, and East London actually has the highest density of Bangladeshi migrants to Britain. Uh, more than 40% of London is a migrant population. Uh, and I felt and I symbolically abandoned my veil on the airplane leaving Riyadh and somebody was calling the lady in seat 32 has forgotten her abaya, and it was mine, but I ran away because I didn't ever want to see it again. And I thought that I would never see an abaya again. And I arrived to work in East London on the district line in Whitechapel, and I was the only unveiled non-Caucasian face in the street. And I met my medical students who came fully veiled. I did not even recognize that this was my British medical student who came veiled. I have published a couple of papers about one of my junior physicians who is a Pakistani British uh, citizen like me, who refused to clean his hands with alcohol hand drug before seeing my patient, uh, stating he was a Muslim and this was haram for him, failing to recognize my father's Muslim name on my jacket and uh, speaking to me as if I didn't know about Islam. So there was a new neo-orthodoxy 
And when I use neo-orthodoxy, I don't use it in an academic term as it may mean to you. Uh, I mean as a revival of practices that, and a rejection of practices that was completely novel. I had only left Britain maybe uh, 12 years earlier. I'd gone to medical school there myself, and we'd not seen any of these. And what you see here is actually some British Muslims who are demonstrating recently in opposition to what they felt was blasphemous. And this is going to become part of our talk later on. And this was er, most likely related to the recent uh, uh, awfully produced video called The Innocence, um, which was very offensive to anyone who decided to watch it, uh, but certainly should not have stoked the violent global outrage that it did. And what I find, the statements, look at the statements on the posters. They're so, they're so uh, non-pacifist, they're so violent. They're as violent or as offensive as the acts that they claim have precipitated them. And you could tran transfer to this any, to anything. You could transfer this to the satanic verses. You could transfer this to the Danish cartoons. You could transfer this to the recent video. And this is where political Islamism is beginning to enter the public space and silence and intimidate. I don't seek to offend anyone, but in these societies, unfortunately, the right to offend and to sustain offense is a protected right. It doesn't mean it's a value that we all aspire to, is to go around and offend people, but we don't intimidate people because we're offended by them. In France, at the same time or sometime later, there was a very visceral response to the arrival of individuals who would adopt the niqab. Now, remember, the niqab is the face veil. To give you an idea as to how alien this is to myself, I remember the first time I saw a niqab. I was seven years old, and I was with my daddy, and we were in London to, at Harrods, which you might remember is a well-known store, and there, I saw a lady with a steel covering on her face and a black cloak. And I remember my father pointing out to me that that was a veiled lady from the Gulf. So my Muslim father is explaining this curious tradition to his young child, young daughter. And the niqab never appeared until post 9-11 Europe. We really didn't see it. In, in my mother growing up in Pakistan, as we were saying, uh, would wear her modest clothing and walk on the bus and go off to medical school and come home again. There was no discussion in her home by her father, who was a scholar of Islam, about wearing this or wearing that or wearing the other. This is very novel. And that it is outside of Arabian Gulf states, unlike the lady I saw in my childhood, is also novel. You've come across this, which was a probably known to you in Switzerland. The request in 2005 uh, to build a Mus an Islamic mosque with a small minaret, no more than about six meters, vehemently triggered an anti-minaret campaign. There are only six minarets in Switzerland. And my father is an architect and town planner, and most of his career, he was working with the city council in England, giving grants to religious institutions. There was a need for a Sikh temple, a Hindu temple, a Muslim mosque, and he was helping the community in line with the British town planning values to have their religious buildings the way they see fit. But by the time this arrived in Switzerland, the appetite that was deemed so uh, threatened by minarets, this image is deliberate, there's a Swiss flag there, and it was a Swiss politician, I think her name was Helena Morgenthal, who was a member of the Swiss People's Party, stated that these minarets are a missile-like object and will uh, intrude on the Swiss national values and perforate Swiss, Swiss national identities, which is the argument. And in fact, it was, in, it was passed legally, and there has now been an amendment to the Swiss constitution that it is not constitutional to build a minaret. Extraordinary, given Switzerland, which has valued itself specifically on religious pluralism and linguistic pluralism and cultural pluralism. So this took Switzerland by surprise, let alone Switzerland's Muslims. But it was driven in a situation where there had been a huge amount of migration in the 80s and 90s, arrival of Muslims that were not sure 
how they could be integrated into Swiss society, whether or not they were invited to integrate, I don't know, and a vi violently hostile reaction. In France, Sarkozy passed legislation, um, and I think that's what this was showing. She's wearing the tricolor, the French flag, as a niqab. He legislated against the niqab in the public space. Uh, the hijab is permitted. And in fact, I supported Sarkozy's position in one of my opinion editorials. Instead of having an engaged discourse, as you were mentioning, um, a Muslim tycoon took it upon himself to create a fund of a million euros, which would be used to pay the, I think, 200 euro fine uh, that a Muslim woman would have to pay for wearing the niqab in public. So we are setting ourselves up for polarization. Again, there is nowhere in Islam that requires a woman to wear a niqab. Nowhere in Islam, in the Quran, that tells you what a veil is. The requirement for veiling in Islam applies to men and women. It is not a clothing, it is a demeanor of how you are to interact with those to whom you're not related or not married. Um, and uh, this is lost. In the environment of political Islamism, these have become symbols of religiosity, but they are new creations or de novo manifestations. In the United States, I don't know how much of you have followed this. There was a very ugly public um, discourse over something called the Ground Zero Mosque. This is a map, obviously, of the area of Ground Zero and the area that the mosque wanted to expand is indicated as some blocks away. Um, my own sentiments as a Muslim is this was the wrong time and uh, this was not appropriate to intrude on a community still attempting to heal. Uh, but it became a very heated and very ugly debate. And uh, the Mayor Bloomberg had to step in and talk about America's secular values that allow all religious institutions to be created wherever they are legally acquiring the land and wherever they're not interfering. Um, but it's very difficult for individuals who have uh, had some connection to September 11th. And certainly my perspectives have changed uh, or become even more sharpened because I'm now the physician for many Americans who were first responders to September 11th. I watched September 11th from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and I saw firemen and policemen going there, and I saw President Bush giving a speech on a fire truck, and 10 to 12 years later found myself listening to the individual stories of the men and women that went there and the wreckage that they see and I treat their post-traumatic stress disorder and I treat their sleep disorders and their depression. So this gives one a very different perspective of an area that has become, in some individuals' words, hallowed ground or sacred ground and this is the memorial that's resulted. The NYPD in New York, where I make my home, has become under great threat because of its attempts to survey activities within Muslim societies uh, or Muslim communities in the United States. And this has vilified them as being intrusive and vi in violation of civil rights. Um, and this argument actually has, I think, unfairly positioned the NYPD uh, to be uh, uh, appearing as an extremely uh, intimidating and uh, lawless entity that is victimizing a Muslim community under siege. That idea of Muslims in America being under siege could not be less true in my opinion. And this is where the battle of narratives unfolds. This is an uh, uh, opportunity I had last year to testify at the King hearings, which examined the uh, arrival and intrusion of radical contemporary Islamism uh, and terrorist activities as they affect the United States. And I looked at lots of data as to how it affects the military, how it affects the civic community, how it affects the uh, um, uh, public space in very frightening ways. Almost always legitimized as being involved in a group which has privileges because they are a religious institution or a religious minority. Make no mistake, political Islamism, whether violent or nonviolent, is seeking a powerful shield underneath Islam. And the three people there, two others testifying with, we're all Muslims. Uh, they are Americans. I am British. 
uh, who, who were in favor of these investigations. So the public space has been pretty active. The evidence that I have for Islam providing promise in the contemporary public space is thin on the ground. And I have been thinking about this, not just for this lecture, but many years. Nowhere does this become more clear than in examining the question of Pakistan. And we, will, we are getting to the close uh, for if anyone uh, needs to leave, I, I understand this. Uh, this is the uh, ma mausoleum to Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the founder of Pakistan. He was a secularist, he was a Muslim. He married a Parsi, which means a Zoroastrian. He had uh, Doberman uh, uh, dogs. He was a very uh, debonair, British trained lawyer. And he had, a, he had some values for Pakistan. His values were, um, th his values were that this should be a democratic state. It was created for the shelter of a religious minority. He feared after Britain would ex exit the British, uh, uh, the Indian uh, uh, subcontinent, that Muslims would be a minority in a largely Hindu nationalist country. And so he asked that this territory be created for Muslims for protection of minorities, but also very specifically in a speech a few days before the creation of Pakistan, he gave a, a lecture to the Karachi club where he said that religion should be beyond the provenance of the state. It is not the business of the state, whether you go to a church or a mosque or a temple, this is the business of the individual. Today, 65 years, Pakistan was 65 in August, um, democracy has been completely abducted by what I call Islamist lawfare. Lawfare means the misuse and abuse of law for political and strategic gain. And there's great legal literature on it. It's usually used in the field of international law or conflict. There's a lot of, of science and uh, knowledge about lawfare pertaining to Israel and Palestine in that conflict. But nowhere par excellence do we see lawfare the way it is practiced in Pakistan. Pakistan is considered the world's first Muslim democracy. Uh, it is a democracy, it has a parliament, there are elections, there are members of parliament. All of the organs of constitutional democracy left behind after the British remain. There's a Supreme Court. But Pakistan legally persecutes religious minorities. It does so with impunity, and you've probably heard about this. This is a picture of a Pakistani passport of a Muslim Pakistani who is designated an Ahmadi. An Ahmadi is a Muslim minority. There are many in Canada, actually, and also in America and Britain who are designated by Pakistan as non-Muslim. Pakistan is the only country, the only body that has changed the definition of what it means to be Muslim. I just recited you the verse that, m that means anyone could be Muslim if they said it with belief. There is no qualifying section to it. That's all there is. Pakistan asks you to say that and co-sign that you denounce Ahmadi Islam. And they conceivably could do that to Shias, they could do it to Sufis. Um, they, uh, I went to Pakistan, I go often, I have a lot of family, but I was particularly interested in the plight of minorities. So many people in my family are physicians and if you go to hospitals, many of the nurses and matrons are Christian. So I asked to meet, and I am here walking down the hallway with a matron who's a Christian, who was explaining to me what it's like to be a Christian living in Pakistan. A med uh, I, walking by a ward, I saw this. Many of the nurses were Christian, and this, I'm sure, was written by a Christian, uh, God bless you, on one of the medication boards. And then shyly, after she got to know me a little while, she showed me her necklace, which was concealed. Uh, you can't tell, I deliberately photographed her from behind. She was wearing a full Pakistani dress, which is the uniform of nurses, but inside her uniform, she showed me her uh, symbol of uh, what we know as Hazrat Isa, the, uh, Jesus uh, Christ. Another, another Christian lady showed me an image of Mary. A uh, medical student there was Christian and said, would you like to meet the uh, uh, Father Edward Joseph of uh, St. Patrick's? Uh, cathedral in Karachi, which is the largest Catholic diocese there. So I went to meet Father Edward Joseph and I asked him, 
What is it like for you to lead your congregation in a country uh, ruled by blasphemy laws? And I'll tell you about blasphemy laws shortly. But he gave me a profound answer. He's, a, he's born in Karachi. He's Pakistani. He went to Rome to learn how to become a uh, father. Um, he showed me his vestments that were made locally. His, uh, I read uh, the first uh, part of Genesis in Urdu. Genesis is called Muqaddas in Urdu. And uh, he's telling me that, well, just as Jesus had his cross to bear, so too do we. Not the least venom, even though we later inspected his, uh, his uh, I think it's called a cathedral, his cathedral uh, that um, had still sustained damage from impact, damage by Pakistani Muslims who'd come in and attempted to detonate a bomb while a congregation was there for many years. The, the uh, community does not have enough money to repair the stained glasses, glasses that we saw um, in the beginning. It, when, I, when, I mean, when I mean by blasphemy, we'll, we'll just stop here for a moment, then we can continue it or we can stop whatever you choose. Uh, in Pakistan, in 1979, Ziaul Haq was in charge. He was, the pre pre he was a general who had essentially executed the leader before him, Zulfiqar Bhutto. But he needed to consolidate political power. And he therefore decided the fastest way to do this was to Islamicize Pakistan. Overnight, he dismantled Catholic schools. Overnight, Western uniform became non-inappropriate. Um, My cousins went from wearing shirts and ties to suddenly wearing Pakistani clothes to school. And um, this was the beginning of a rewriting of whatever you'd like to call Pakistan's constitutional laws. Anything designated by an arbitrary body called the Fer Federal Sharia Court, not appointed, not elected, was kicked out for being un-Islamic. And anything that could offend what these individuals felt was not Islamic was labeled blasphemy. But two particular uh, laws applied specifically to the Ahmadi Muslims that were designated as blasphemous if they used an Islamic term, if they said salams to you, if they have a burial in a Muslim cemetery, if they go to a place of worship and call it a mosque, if they give the azan, they legislated against this group. Now, it so happens that in the entire electorate of Pakistan, minorities are given only, minorities may constitute 5% or less of the population. Uh, the minorities are given no more than 10 seats out of 215 parliamentary seats. There is no political uh, capital in trying to represent a minority because you're never going to have an influence in parliament. So they are effectively disempowered. And if you are a minority Muslim that is not official, you have to sign a denial of your own faith. If you don't sign a denial, you're not allowed to vote. So they have married a public version of Islam with a political democratic process, which is profoundly abusive. Christians often come under this because of certain um, very, very uh, dangerous politics that are being practiced. Now, I have a little bit more to show you about a visit to a very troubled area, but people are getting restless. Do, do you want to stop and take questions, or do you want to see a little more? No. Please, be, please be honest, because I'm not holding anyone hostage here. <laughs> Sawat, Sawat, Sawat is an area that you may have heard of. It's actually in the northwestern frontier of Pakistan, Towards, it's not on the Afghan border, but it's up towards that region. It's exactly level to um, Kabul. And I was invited to go to Malakan, the place that was beloved to Churchill. Churchill actually built some of the first forts there, Churchill's first conflict, because he went in search of war to make himself a great man, was at Malakan. And these are the roads up to Malakan where I went last. And here's an example of one of the consequences of an opportunity like the Templeton Cambridge Fellowship for me. One of the speakers at a Templeton Cambridge program that I was invited to listen to was a Dr. Fariha Paracha, who is a Pakistani woman who's a neuropsychologist who rehabilitates Pakistani children who have been Taliban operatives. So I went to her talk in Cambridge, courtesy of the Templeton Cambridge program, and I told her I'm coming to see you. So we engineered a trip. 
it's very difficult. I went with my own motives. I want to see what you're doing and I want to write about it. But this is high risk. So she uh, invited me to come as a visiting physician, much less threatening. So I went under false pretenses, effectively, as a visiting physician. These are the roads. It's an absolutely idyllic place. This was our escort. We came in an unmarked car and two or three hundred miles away from our destination, we were met by Pakistani rangers, six of them who guarded us day and night three, uh, for three days. We slept in the Malakan fort. We were incredibly well protected because uh, we had come to see a school that was a civil, civic operation between the Pakistani military and the Pakistani community of which Dr. Parachi is a, is a member. This is the view from my room from the Malakan fort and you see a shepherd taking his cows to pasture in the early morning. There's a red flag which is the national color of Sawat. This is the Sawat Valley. It's uh, my photographs are not very good. It's incredible physical beauty and it is a place of extraordinarily violent manifestation of, tal of, of the consequences of the Taliban. Currently, this was in 2012, Three years ago, the Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, had encroached upon this valley, was terrorizing the public, and the Pakistani military, from 60 miles out of Islamabad, pushed them out. This is the front line on what has been casually known as the war on terror, which has now been sanitized to some other name. Uh, but this is the kind of place where these conflicts are, are waged. Mingora, many of you will have heard of. We stayed in Mingora because we wanted to see, uh, excuse me, we stayed in Malakan because we wanted to visit the school in Mingora. But you probably knew about Mingora when a Pakistani girl called Malala Yousafzai, this rings a bell, was shot in the left temple going to school because she had the audacity to advocate for Pakistani boys and girls to have a right to education. And this became global news as well as it should. And she sought higher treatment in the University of Birmingham in England. So this was that place. And along the way, I was very surprised as a Pakistani woman who's traveled to Pakistan for 40 years now to see little girls in the SWAT going to school. These are SWAT school girls with their red ch chathers falling off their head. There's probably an older boy looking after them. I'm in my driver's car trying to snap a couple of pictures, and they just come out of school. They can now go to school because the Pakistani military has secured the area, but these are the targets of a... a okay, we can, I will call it political Islamism in the Pakistani public space. The reason they target girls and girls getting an education is it's seen as a secular value. A secular value is considered as a Western innovation, and it is considered profoundly Islam un-Islamic. This is anathema to Islam. But th this, this, these are the targets. So we get to the school, which is called Sabaun, which means the first ray of sunlight. And we learnt about Sabaun in Cambridge with Dr. Julia Vaitula Martin and Dr. Fariha Paracha and Dr. Fraser Watts and all these people that uh, the Dr. Templeton knows and, and Dr. Josephine Templeton knows. And you see there's a Pakistani flag and there's a little courtyard, and it was an idyllic school, such as these children would never have seen. It's processed approximately, or educated approximately 168 children, all boys aged 10 to 20, all of them uh, convicted of terrorist operations. Um, you cannot film this picture, thank you. And this is actually a picture of boys on the cricket field outside the school, the Swat Valley is behind the wall, and all of these boys were once operatives, and by operatives they could be informers, they could be actually uh, perpetrating attacks, they could be perpetrating attacks with grenades, with machine guns, uh, some of them had kidnapped Pakistani soldiers, these are the boys. Now they have, by the time they get to the school, they have been picked up obviously by the Pakistani police, interrogated for months by the Pakistani intelligence called the ISI, deemed to be healthy enough to come in and get an education. And then they go through intense psychotherapy and re, um, programming is too strong a word, but re-education in Islam. One of the rules in this school is that they cannot learn the Quran without translation. 
In this chair, I listened to the story uh, of a young boy who was about 16 in cricket clothing. He looked very much like my own brother did when he was an awkward 15 or 16 years old, all elbows, mumbling, not really looking in the eye. And he uh, was a very endearing character because he was speaking to me in Urdu, also not very good, like my brother's Urdu is not as good as it should be. Um, and then he dis described this horrific induction. He was a boy walking to school. Another teenager came up to him. Why don't you come this way? The Taliban subscribes a purer form of Islam. The Taliban has got rid of all the opium that used to be here. They're getting rid of alcohol that used to be here. This is the right way. You shouldn't really be wasting your time going to school. And the conversations led to his induction, which led to his hiding in a number of centers, sometimes spending nights in those mountains I've shown you. His first assignment was to go and attack a military installation with several boys. They killed five individuals. Another um, event uh, uh, was involving the apprehension and kidnapping of a number of Pakistani soldiers. Much of this I didn't know until after I read his psychiatric notes. But he told me the story of his induction. And he has severe post-traumatic stress disorder. He has a head injury. He's going to be permanently damaged. But he stopped at the point of detonating his suicide jacket. His was, he was asked to go into a Shia mosque. Shias uh, are uh, considered deviant uh, by these extremist Muslims. Uh, Muslims are used very loosely here, but considered deviant. And he entered the mosque and he realized, well, they look like they're praying just like me. And I don't know if this is right. And in his hesitation, a police officer recognized him and disabled him. He talked about his Islamic education. He used a word that we use called tarbiyat, which means education or kind of intellectual breeding. And for me, my tarbiyat was with my parents, learning my Quran, understanding the rationale. A lot of what you're doing here would be considered tarbiyat. But to him, it meant operation of a pistol, operation of a grenade, and detonation of a suicide jacket. And he used these words for me. And I've published on this if you wish to read it. Finally, the blasphemy laws probably came to your attention a few days near when we saw the devastating shooting of a U.S. Congresswoman, Gabby Gifford, here in this country, at around the same time, there had been a devastating assassination in Pakistan of this gentleman in this picture, Governor Salman Taseer, very handsome fellow, who had the audacity to be a Muslim governor of Punjab, the most powerful state the most moneyed state, it's a martial state, it's where all the seat of power is in Pakistan at the moment, um, because he had objected to the blasphemy laws and asked for them to be repealed because this Christian woman from a small village had been accused of blasphemy, usually like everything else on hearsay and incarcerated, and he came to her defense. That was a fatal mistake. It was a fatal mistake that actually Governor Tasir had anticipated in one of his last interviews at a university because he had a feeling that his life was at risk. And because he, de he, because he defended that Christian, he was deemed by a Pakistani cleric to be wajib al-qatl, which means eligible for execution. And this image, this ghoulish image, where a man is being greeted like a rock star, is Mumtaz Qadri, who was his assassin. And I want you to really look at this picture because this is what Pakistan has created. This is what I will call politely political Islamism, but actually there are no words for it. And in the picture I see, he is garlanded. He was actually garlanded with flowers. There's a red uh, garland. Uh, when you get married in Pakistan, they give you flowers. So this is a kind of wedding garland. He was garlanded at his arraignment where he was charged with the murder of Salman Taseer. He didn't flee from his murder. He was part of the security detail. And he, he turned on the governor and shot him point blank in broad daylight and then turned himself in and said he was just a servant of God. And the men around him, you will see, I don't know if there is a, you see there is a man 
with a police cap who's smiling. There are people hailing him. Um, there is someone thinking, thank God I'm in this picture. This is adulation. This is adulation for the domination and the extinction of, a, of someone who supported minorities. It's hard to explain to you how powerful Governor Tessier was. He wasn't just a politician. He's from a legendary scholarly family in Pakistan. He was also a newspaper magnate and a publisher. So I don't know what the US equivalent would be of someone of that stature to be assassinated. And this is the country's reaction. At his arraignment, the lawyers applauded in court. This is an image very similar. We're getting towards right at the end because it's such a discouraging conversation to have that even I'm finding it difficult to carry on. These are temporary graves of Ahmadi Muslims, minority Muslims. Ahmadi Muslims eschew violence. They accept there are verses in the Quran which espouse violence, but they believe we're in an age of modernism. If there is to be any concept of struggle, it will be through the pen, i.e. dialogue, not through the sword. And these are their temporary graves because they were executed in a mosque in 2010, numbering approximately 93 individuals. The attack was televised and the massacre went on and nobody intervened. Nobody has been apprehended for this crime. More recently, if you're designated not an official Muslim by a country which now redefines what it means to be a Muslim, and you have the audacity, be, audacity to be buried as a Muslim, perhaps with Muslim verses on your headstone, as maybe somebody has uh, verses of, I don't know if they have verses of the Torah on their headstone or the Bible, but Muslims often may put something there. This is deemed blasphemous. So posthumously, your graves are erased and your graves are desecrated because it was blasphemy to, for you to claim the use of Islam. Now, I can't imagine of anything more perverse. So my conclusion is that while historically the promise of Islam really was tremendous in architecture, in the arts, in the literature, in the sciences, in uh, the creation of beauty and what was truly a civilization, which remember at some point in Islam borrowed from Hellenic culture and borrowed from Aristotelian culture and Jewish scripture, that era is not here. We are now in an era where the perils far exceed the promise because what passes for Islam is actually political Islamism. And um, these perils become very, very problematic when the structures guarding the public space are very weak. Whether you are in a theocracy that is a monarchy or whether you are in a so-called democracy as in Pakistan, and we use that term very loosely. When Islamism dominates the narrative as it does today, the perils are enormous. And this is why it is so difficult for individuals who are in charge of the civic public space uh, to protect it, to chaperone it, to develop it. It is so difficult for you to engage on matters pertaining to Muslims if you are unable to distinguish between political Islamism and Islam. And certainly in the politics of our administration, there has been a profound failure, I mean the US administration, a profound failure to separate political Islamism from Islam. This is why we are not allowed in, in official documents, let's say in the Federal Bureau of Investigations or in other agencies to use the word jihadist. When in Saudi Arabia, they are catching jihadists in their own language. Or in Pakistan, those kids that you just saw were being rehabilitated by Pakistani Muslims because they were known to be Islamist and not Muslim. We haven't had the courage to have that debate. So we started the talk with a view through a 16th century window at the time when the Muslim civilization was just about to decline, but it was, was at a quite a pinnacle in the form of Shah Jahan. And this is a window uh, looking, and many of you may have already been there, through the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar, built, uh, designed by IMP, an extraordinary st structure, and it's looking at the powerful skyline of modern day Qatar. But I feel that the sentiments when we look through this window 
of what the potential of Islam is now are very different than whoever gazed through that 16th century window of what the potential of Islam once was. So I want to thank you, not just for your attention, but for providing the security to have such a difficult conversation, which I'm hoping did not cause offense, but I think you're very brave to, to host this dialogue. Thank you.